Hey friends, welcome back. This is Joel Richardson. And uh, as promised, uh, we are continuing our series of conversations with different voices, different leaders in the body of Christ. Um, previously, I had a chat with my friend Jose Diaz talking about the man in white appearing to uh, kids in the midst of the the earthquake, the tragedy, the the, the insanity uh, in Turkey. And then last week we had a chat with Lee Cummings, who heads up uh, Radiant Network. And uh, in this episode, we are having a chat with Michael Miller. So um, even just saying that, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of people watching this that right off the top of your head, you know who Michael is, but there's a whole bunch who don't. So real briefly, again, I'm just going to introduce you, Michael, and then I'll have you sort of introduce yourself to the audience a little bit more. Um, but Michael is the founding pastor and senior leader of a church slash movement called Upper Room. So the the uh, the mothership, so to speak, is down in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, um, but he's got multiple um, locations. I'll just say this, Upper Room is right now, as I look out across the body of Christ and Again, I know we've got a pretty wide, broad range of listeners. I am sort of um, in the more independent, charismatic segment of the body of Christ, but I appreciate, you know, if you're if you look at us sideways, I still appreciate you and so forth. But in my world, when I look out at sort of independent, charismatic USA, you know, that segment of the church one of the more towering mountains of influence is the upper room. Um, upper room has been really impacting. Um, I mean, a lot of people, but in particular millennials and even Gen Z, uh, just a really dynamic movement that is really setting people's hearts on fire. So I really appreciate what the Lord is doing uh, through upper room, through Michael um, and he's a friend. We, you know, in fact, I, I don't want to overblow this. We haven't, it's not like we've spent a lot, tremendous amount of time together. Um, but, um, you know, I've appreciated Michael from a distance and we've chatted a bit actually during COVID. He had me come and um, teach some sort of Zoom classes um, when COVID was just kicking in. And that was, that was sort of the strange new world that we were all facing. So I was blessed to be able to to connect a bit with with his people but michael go ahead and just jump in i know that was just a super brief summary of upper room but just tell everyone those who are not familiar with who you are what upper room is what you're doing some of your main pretty much anything you want to say just go ahead and jump sure. in sure sure well thanks for having me joel it's an honor to to know you and your ministry has deeply impacted upper room impacted my life personally uh helped me as a pastor just navigate a lot of the just the the unknowns that we've had to navigate the last two three years. Your your revelation has has really helped. But my my wife and I started a prayer meeting uh, in downtown Dallas in 2010. We had an invitation from a business owner. He was actually a veterinarian who owned a number of veterinarian clinics in Dallas, but his corporate headquarters was in Oak Lawn, which is the homosexual district of Dallas uptown post-Christian environment. Um, it, it's been described as a, a church planning graveyard. And uh, and we went down with an invitation to start a prayer meeting. We only thought it would go seven weeks uh, from Passover. It was uh, this week we actually turned 14. So it was from Passover to Pentecost. And uh, we saw God's hand on that prayer meeting for the first seven weeks and thought, let's go through the summer and uh, community birthed, um, and before we knew it, we were pastoring a church. So uh, my background, I'm 23 years in uh, full-time ministry, local church vocation uh, as a pastor, and so um, I just wasn't in that season thinking we were planning a church in that neighborhood. It wouldn't have been the neighborhood I would have chosen, uh, but but God had different plans and um, and and that really shaped I think the vision of our church was the 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 genesis of that invitation to 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 do a prayer meeting so um, we now are however many years later we're doing morning noon and night prayer we do it six days a week uh, we have uh, a school of ministry that has just about 200 
um, millennials, Gen Z, primarily there. Uh, they do 10 hours of training, Bible teaching, and then 10, 15 hours of prayer in uh, our prayer room. So uh, it's been a cool work that God's done and uh, lots of young people were seeing them impacted. That's awesome. That's amazing. So I, I wasn't quite sure what your schedule is. So so you're doing three corporate prayer meetings, six days a week. And how long you've been doing that? Uh, since 2010, we, we, we adopted, uh, there was a, a kind of a spiritual mom in my life who, uh, had a prayer room in her living room and no one was coming except me and my wife. Occasionally we would come, but her and her husband moved down to this neighborhood and asked if I would adopt those hours. And I said, sure. And so she was doing morning and evening and then uh, we ended up putting a noon slot, you know, Psalms 55, I think it's verse 17 says evening, morning and noon, I cry out to you. And I thought, hey, we we can do that. Uh, we can do the the three days a week or th three times a day. And um, and and it it now I think from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. We have live sets happening here in Dallas, but the primary sets full teams are the morning, noon and night, uh, which is is it's a really good rhythm for us as a local church pastor. I think sometimes the 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 prayer movement can be about quantity and you know how much are you praying? And I thought, well, let's let's just get in a rhythm where we're doing we're doing prayer well a couple of times a week, and that's just organically grown. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing, and this is a foreign concept. I think to a lot of people, you know, they think, well, you've got church, you've got your local church. Um, that might sponsor a prayer meeting, but really you are a church that was birthed out of a prayer meeting. And so the right. prayer culture is the foundation for everything you guys do. So just curiously, um, obviously there are various models in prayer movements. I'm here in Kansas City. Good sure. friends, you know, obviously with IHOP, KC and this sort of thing, but you've got so many other approaches. You've got Pete Gregg out of the UK. You know, he had his sort of... Uh, model and approach and all sorts of different models i'm just curious what's the like how what what category or what umbrella would you say you guys fall under uh hopefully the simple one <laughs> we, we tried to keep it as simple as possible um with the presence of jesus being being the focus hosting god's presence and uh and our our prayer model it's it's three movements we we always start with thanksgiving we enter the gates with thanksgiving we move into worship and then worship is on to intercession. So we call it TWI, just Thanksgiving worship intercession. And uh, there's some nuances that the bigger teams have, how, how we partner and unify and create create faith. But but Thanksgiving worship intercessions are our main flow. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm actually going to ask you, I, so I've given Michael a list of questions. I'm actually going to ask you the last question first, since we're on this. But um, Mike Bickle is, has been calling uh, he's begun calling everyone that I think that he knows to jump on this 21 day fast in May, which is, it has some personal meaning for him because it goes back to his 40 years from having started the ministry here in Kansas city. But I'm just curious, are you guys jumping in or what, what's your, what are your plans with that? I, I, I plan on throwing in, I haven't heard, uh, I haven't caught Mike's narrative and what, what, what he's calling people into. We're, we're actually doing an event the day before Pentecost. So I think it's all culminating to Pentecost in, in Jerusalem there. But the day before that, we're hosting a, a gathering in Estonia, um, upper room along with Lou was going to be a part of it, but I think Lou's going to be in Jerusalem now. And then uh, Sergey, Pastor Sergey, who's there, uh, there's going to be a corporate event um, there in Tallinn, Estonia. So we're, we're going to do, I think it's, I think it's 10 hours of prayer. Uh, that's Saturday for the conflict over there in Ukraine. So we're going to fast leading up to that. So it'll kind of be a, a two focused fast, both for Israel and for what's happening in Russia and Ukraine. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah. I'm going to be jumping in. I'll actually be in Israel when the whole thing starts. So that'll oh, great. be tough just because I'll be traveling and busy and so forth, but I'm going to jump in. I just want to ask that because it's, it seems like I've never seen him more motivated and, and um, yeah, just ha have so much energy on something I, in 
the 30 years that I've been in Kansas City, I've I don't know that I've ever seen him so jazz. So is it it's a 21 day fast starting at the beginning of May? Is that correct? It's starting in early May, like okay. you said. And then I think yeah, it culminates. I don't know if it culminates exactly on Pentecost or right in that window. And as you said, I think Lou Engel will be in Jerusalem and sort of break bread and take communion to break the fast on the yes. southern steps. He he is such a catalytic, just heart and leader, and so and a, a spiritual father to me. I absolutely adore him. So um, I'm, I'm I'm grateful for him. Amen. Amen. For those of you who don't know who Lou Engel is, he's definitely uh, an unusual character. Not that I can speak, but man, what an absolute powerhouse! I say unique. I mean, I, I think that's pretty fair. He is a unique individual. But oh, he, for sure. he is one of the most, like, there are a few people in my life that I have, you know, I could, I could go to a meeting where Lou is preaching. I could go there backslidden, angry, not <laughs> wanting to go to church and leave going, I'm doing a 40 day fast starting now, now, you know, <laughs> like, like literally just listen in for 45 minutes and it just imparts passion for prayer. And it, it's, he's an incredible guy. He, he really is and and it has had that similar impact on on our world when he blows through we we weren't planning a fast but we always end up in one <laughs> once you bring him in and uh and then his his passion right now has been uh the table and communion and uh and that's been very central to us in in 2023 this year I'm trying to so far I personally have have hit it but I'm I'm teaching every weekend on the table of the Lord Oh, wow. And uh, just really think it's it's a it's a vital piece to where the Lord's calling the church to gather around the table and to really uh, commune with Him. And uh, and so, anyways, it's been a been a fun fun partnership in that with Lou. Awesome! Oh, that's that's amazing. I've actually been super focused on that as well. Um, it, not to not to distract, but with all of my, I've been spending a lot of time going to Saudi Arabia. Um, to what I really believe is the real Mount Sinai. And within the story, of course, at the end of the Lord making this betrothal covenant with Israel, Moses and the elders of Israel, they go up basically halfway up on the mountain and they, they have a feast. They eat. It says they, they ate and drank and they, or it says they saw God and they ate and drank, which is just an amazing verse. In and of itself, they look up and they see God's feet. But this supper is the prophetic, prototypical um, meal, which we're called to look back to, to remember, because Passover is all about remember, 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 right. as we look forward to the ultimate theophany, the ultimate coming down of God when Jesus returns from heaven. The theophany at Mount Sinai, of course, was just a, a prelude, but right in the middle of it, right in between that first feast, the first uh, banquet table, if you will, on the mountain, and the final marriage banquet um, on Mount Zion, right in the middle is that feast of the Lord. And in the same way that we're called to look back in order to look forward with the Lord's Supper, we're looking back, we're memorializing, we're remembering, but we're looking forward yeah. to the day when we'll, we'll drink it fresh with him in his kingdom. I, I've been really moved by uh, Paul's instruction in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, "I for I received from the Lord. So Paul himself received revelation about the meal. And then the next couple of verses, we can, we can find that information in the Gospels. So he's repeating what we already knew, but it's verse 26. I think it is the revelation that Paul received from the Lord. He says, for as often as we eat this bread, drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Yeah. And it's that looking back to what was his death until he comes back to have that meal with us. So we, we've, we've said in the midst of what is, we look back to what was, to what will be. But it's those three dimensions, I think, that the table of the Lord presents to us. And I think it was Paul's, the message he received from the Lord. Hey, what, what, what happened then? And, and this meal points back to that. I'm coming and I'm not going to eat this meal until 
until I return. And so it, it we've we've often called it the Maranatha meal that uh, that, it's, that it's setting up for uh, the the great hope, the blessed hope of the church. So I I, I could know I know that's not what we're on the podcast for, but I get so passionate talking about um, the table of the Lord. Yeah, no, no. I mean, th th that's that's what I live for is the Maranatha cry. I actually included a question along that line. Obviously, I'm just, you know, pretty laser focused in terms of so much of my teaching. I'm focused on the return of the Lord, recovering the Maranatha message and that sort of thing. So just I actually I'm going to jump in with this pastorally. Again, here you are leading a movement um again not all by any means but definitely a movement impacting as you said millennials and gen z's and millennials and gen z's are the sort of <clears throat> golden chalice of pastoral man. everybody always wants to impact the youth because they're the future not that they're any better it's just you know right. when, you, when you buy a car you try to get one with low mileage you know it's a maximum <laughs> type of thing but in terms of pastoring your movement to what degree has the Maranatha message been part of just your teaching and focus, let's say the past few years, how does that play into kind of what you guys are doing? Right. I, I, um, I, I was touched with the Maranatha message personally. So it started with me and my bride. We took our first trip to Israel in January of 2020. So right before COVID came, uh, my dear friend, Rabbi Jason Sobel, uh, invited my wife and I and a couple of other uh, kind of influencers, pastors to, to join him. And, uh, you know, next to next to meeting the Holy Spirit in my early 20s, um, Israel and God's heart for Israel marked my life uh, personally. Just it was it was something I had heard of, something I had studied and had value for but until i went to the land and actually saw it myself um it hit me personally and then and then i knew uh we were we were leading a ton of uh really worship leaders that that were that were having international influence and i really sensed the lord uh leading me to to get them rooted in his heart for his people in his land. And so eight weeks later, I took a handful of them to Jerusalem and I saw God do the same thing in them. And so it started with my core team. And then we just tried to catch up to what, and we're still catching up to what the Lord imparted to our hearts. And that's where, you know, I, I stumbled upon F FAI and you guys and and what y'all are, are, are teaching and leading out. Um, I did one series called uh, Maranatha, and and I really focused Joel on on the the meta narrative of where this is all going, and I looked at the Maranatha message starting in Genesis one, and I tried to show the end from the beginning, and we looked at every covenant that God made. So we saw the Maranatha message in the Edemic covenant, we saw it in the Noahic covenant, we saw it in the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, the Mosaic and Davidic. And so I just looked at what was promised and then what's outstanding. And so how the work of salvation, the cross points to the plan of redemption, which is his second return. And and I, I think a lot of young people, uh, the Maranatha message came alive to them because these were stories a lot of them knew, but they hadn't tied them to uh, the Omega, to the end, to to what's coming. And so that that that's about as is as thorough as I've done on the weekend. Our school we do a lot of more in depth uh, looking into some of the the, the Revelation and Daniel or open up the Book of Revelation. But um, I would say we're we're still uh, still learning how to to roll that out to our community at large. You know, I was talking to my wife just the other day. You know, whatever, just the news cycle. Elon Musk making a comment about this or that and AI is going to destroy us within 10 years, you know, like kind of all yeah. of the, all of the stuff, just the daily news cycle that makes you depressed. And I was just like, man, I just I feel so bad for our kids and for their kids. The idea of having to grow up in the world today, it really it's legitimately depressing. I feel like I'm I'm a few years or several years older than you, but I'm like. I feel like 
I was part of the last great generation before personal computers and cell phones and social media just flooded in. And now we're dealing with sort of the next wave of technology and how it's just changing everything. And I don't mean to be depressing, but, <laughs> you know, for me, I, I look at the, the young folks today and I go, what better message do they need than the hope? of the renewal of all things, the restoration of Eden and the, the purging by fire of this current whole wicked, messed up, insane system. I go, man, this message, I think if it's, if it's proclaimed properly, it is the message of hope that um, mm -hmm. this generation needs to, to navigate the future. It's, it's difficult. Um, but along these lines, I want to, I want to, this is really kind of the, the main issue that I wanted to just pick your brain um, or just have you share your thoughts. Let me let me ask you this question first, um, because off the top of my head, I don't know what what is the loose cutoff between the millennials and Gen Z? I, I think the early 20s right now is 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 the beginning of Gen Z, if if I'm correct, I think I think the 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 younger millennials are now in their mid to late twenties and then Gen Z's hitting right around 20, 22. Um, I, I could be off a couple of years, but I, I think we're seeing that, um, that change. And then I do know this. I know that, that one fourth of America is Gen Z. It's 25% of the population. And, and I think what's coming is, is not just, not just Gen Z, not just them impacting culture, but they're going to be culture. They're going to be uh, who uh, we we target for marketing and our entertainment. It's going to center around this generation, and um, it's the first generation native to technology. Um, there's just a lot of unique uh, dynamics to this generation, and uh, I think it's a great opportunity for the church. Um, I think it's it's the mission field for us. Um, and I see a great hunger in Gen Z specifically. I see I see them looking for more than what we as the church have actually offered. Um, but I, I think I think it's 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 that early 20, late teen would would be the the beginning of Gen Z. Tell me, why, why do you say that? Why do you say you think they're more hungry than we realize? Like just, um, yeah, I, I think they're looking for a cause. Um, they're looking for something to rally behind. Um, you, you, you see it politically, you see it. Uh, uh, I, I just see them, them really looking for something to stand for. And and there's these these cultural narratives that that emerge and 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 they're they're just hoodwinked by them a lot of times they're 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 just caught right in the middle of it and it's kind of a babble of 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 thoughts it's these these echo chambers these these voices that are saying this is how you should think and i just see them in droves uh going after that but i i've seen it on a small level, level with the gospel um, you know, we have a, just, this may be encouraging to some pastors, but, uh, you know, we, 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 when we planted up a room, everything that the book says, uh, not to do, we did. And, and it was just one of those, those things only God could have built this, but this last Sunday night, our 5 PM service, um, people start lining up at 3 PM. And by the time we open the doors up around 415, there's a couple of hundred people waiting in line to get in the church. And then our service starts at five and Joel, it doesn't end. Two weeks ago, I preached. I didn't get up to preach till 645. So it was an hour and 40 minutes of worship. And then I preached for an hour. I preached from 645 to 745. And then we ministered to 830. So it was a three and a half hour service that some people waited two hours to get into. Wow. And and that that is to me the hunger that I see in 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 this generation. They're all they're all millennials, and then and then Gen Z. Our 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 Sunday night service looks like a H and M catalog. It's all these you know young hipster kids that are that are 
just trying to find their way, but they're, 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 they're being captivated by Jesus. And, and so I just say that in context to what I see when I say I see a hunger in them. I'm seeing it not just not just in a big event that we're hosting. It's on a weekly basis uh, that that these guys are doing that. And and I, I again, I just think they're looking for more. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. That's that's awesome to hear. Most churches are hemorrhaging, and you've got people lined up on a Sunday night. So, um, okay, I, along these lines, we're talking about, again, just impacting the millennials, Gen Z, the younger generation. Um, it would be easy for a lot of people right now to just say, I don't even want to reach them. You know, it's actually interesting to be old enough now to look back because for so long, we really, so are you, are, are you Gen X or are you? Gen, yeah, I would be Gen X. Okay. So Gen X. Thank you. I think I'm smack dab right in the middle of Gen X. Yep. Um, our generation. Someday Kurt Cobain's going to come back from the dead and save us all. No, just kidding. I was going to say Nirvana, Pearl Jam. But yeah, I was there. Yeah. So in any case, um, so you're, you're Gen X. But I mean, for so long, we made fun of the millennials. But it's interesting to have lived long enough to see now the millennials are turning on gen z and going like we don't like them or they're they're lazy or they're too liberal you know this type of thing and, and to be old enough to step back and look down at it all and kind of smile and say i wonder what the gen z you know what their opinions will be of the next generation what yeah. they'll have to say as they get older and this this type of thing but so obviously i'm a, i'm a futurist thinker i'm always looking at the future i'm looking at the challenges that are on the horizon yeah theologically um you've got two dynamics in scripture one is the scriptures say there is this great falling away coming we can look out at the world right now and see yeah. you know, famous christian names we can see people abandoning the faith and this type of thing it's it's sort of already happening but on the other hand there's also the reality um, and you could look at a handful of different passages, but there is the very clear reality, Joel chapter 2, the Lord says, in the last days, specifically before the great and terrible day of the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons, your daughters will prophesy, your old men, that's us, or at least that's me, we'll, we'll drink <laughs> And this, this type of thing, so you've kind of got these two dynamics, this tension within scripture, but in light of this, in light of these two very important pastoral realities, what are you, like, how is this affecting just the way that you're shepherding, again, the younger folks to prepare them for both, both right. the apostasy and the coming revival? Right. It's a, it's a, it's a great question that I think we're learning to navigate um, as as the cultural narrative is continuously presented to this generation, it's getting the biblical narrative in front of them. And, and you're right. I, I think Mike Bickle describes it as it, it there's going to be great glory and it's also going to be gory. Uh, there's going to be those two dynamics. And my, my number one concern for uh, people that I'm pastoring, young people that I'm pastoring is that uh, is that they're not deceived, that they're equipped to filter the latest news cycle, the latest injustice, that they have a filter to view it through scripture. And I think Jesus in Matthew 24, he, he was very clear. He, he started out by saying, don't be misled. And in that hour, there's a leadership crisis. There's a void. And many will step into that void and go, hey, I'm the Christ. And I, I don't think it's necessarily the the antichrist although i know he will come i think it's an antichrist spirit that's attempting to offer a form of righteousness that's not rooted in scripture and i think i think injustices emerge you know you you open your phone you see it almost weekly uh where where these crises hit and then and then you have you have the commentary around it and 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 these injustices make us angry. What happened at the Covenant Presbyterian School in Nashville last week? It 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 
it infuriates you. It is heartbreaking. Um, and, and, and it creates a, a, a need for leadership. It creates a need for people to be pastored and we've got to process this, but right now it's our, it's our iPhones or a social platform that's, that's informing us how to think, especially for Gen Z and millennials. So I'm trying to get out ahead of that and to say, Hey, he, here's the leadership of Jesus. This is, this is, this is the leadership of Jesus, what it looks like in that hour, and and that he has the, the the final word on on what true justice is. So I, I think justice and injustice is is the gateway for this deception that that the world's going to attempt to define justice and pervert it. Uh, and so that's that's what I saw with with Black Lives Matter, with the critical race theory. Um, I think that those were just just small examples they were big at the time but they were small i think precursors for us to to really get ahead of this narrative and to inform our people hey this is what we need this is how we need to think not what we need to think but how we need to think so um uh, i think leadership is is crucial yeah that's good um stuart greaves actually wrote a book called false justice and you know, I, I think as we get closer to the last days, the return of Jesus, the more that there is a glaring, obvious lack of justice throughout the earth. I mean, you know, whether it's uh, whether it's socioeconomic justice or, you know, any number of forms of justice, there's, there's a lack. And there is a cry, a God-given cry within all of us for justice. And so among the the younger generations, they tend to always have this tremendous focus on justice. Thus, they tend to be incredibly susceptible to the right. counterfeit justice movements. Right. And, and it's addictive. I can tell you, you know, like I've been in protests, mostly in other countries, but, you know, so I'll, I'll just say this as a funny anecdote um, because it's now 10 years ago. 10 years ago, Dalton... Um, with FAI, Dalton Thomas and I, we were in Turkey, in Istanbul, and this was the height of the Arab Spring. All of the world news media was like, the Arab Spring has finally reached Turkey. And so the whole summer was just massive protests against the government. Well, we were doing a documentary. We wanted to demonstrate what the Lord is doing in the midst of the Arab Spring. So we show up to Istanbul with cameras. Now, ultimately, the protests were to protest the government plowing down some green space in Taksim Square, and they were going to build this sort of um, uh, replica of a military barracks, sort of a mosque and this type of thing. So in other words, it was a Turkish thing. I had no connection with what they were protesting, but we show up at the protests, we get tear gas, we almost get killed by the cops. Oh my goodness. <laughs> And there's just this natural thing that happens that says, hey, you shouldn't treat people this way. And you naturally then want to stand in solidarity with these people. I have no idea what they're upset about, but I stand with them. Anyway, with all this said, I look at the return of Jesus and his kingdom. Overwhelmingly, the primary way that the kingdom, the messianic kingdom is described is the kingdom of justice and righteousness. And I just, I feel like if we direct their passion for justice toward that Maranatha message, that kingdom that's coming, the kingdom of justice, that is, you know, that which the Lord is, um, has, has built into all of us. But instead of, instead of um, expressing it through our passion for the return of Jesus, we express it through passion for you know, whatever it might be, Black Lives Matters or this or that or the latest political, you know, yada, yada. Um, so I'm going to shift here a little bit um, in terms of, again, pastoring the younger generations. I've got some friends that are doing a lot of, I'll say, pastoral ministry on TikTok and Discord. Yeah. And um, and they're really impacting you know, the, the Gen Z's and so forth, but at the forefront of everything they do is they're constantly dealing with issues of same-sex attraction. Now with all the transgenderism and everything, this is obviously just sort of in the news at the forefront. 
of cultural discussion and this sort of thing. How much are you as a pastor, how, how big of a part of just trying to shepherd this generation into the things of the Lord? How much of this are you having to personally deal with? Oh yeah, daily, it daily. And then mo most every weekend we're, we're mentioning uh, those things. Um, what was it? Carl Barth, who said you preach with the Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. Like you just, you want, you want to speak into what people are talking about anyways. And specifically with Gen Z on Sunday nights, we talk openly and often about sexuality, about gender. Uh, we talk about politics. We, we, we don't, we don't skate around that. And then we also provide context for people to come to the table. So we, we really encourage conversations that, that we're, we're asking more questions that we're seeking to understand those that are different than us. Um, we have a really diverse community. I would say, you know, our church is probably 40% white and then maybe 30% black, 30% Hispanic. So we have, we have a, fairly diverse community and I think it's because of the neighborhood that we're in but we, we just realized I as a white guy and grew up in North Dallas I got a lot to learn <laughs> and so I led the conversation in 2020 2021 about hey what what do I need to know what questions have I not asked and we came around a table and it was extremely helpful for me uh to learn from from people in my community uh but but as well for them to learn to learn from from you know a, a white guy that grew up in North Dallas like there was just this mutual respect and honor and um we we lended our ears to one another and i i think i think we we need to listen more no one's really listening and so to come to a table where you can have those conversations um uh, i i don't know if we were uh supposed to learn a lot about this from twitter <laughs> it, it really has to be with people i know people that i'm doing life with um and and so we we brought all those conversations really to a table where we as a family could process them uh so i've i've found the table being very helpful in regards to these cultural conversations and then i think to on a weekend preaching wise uh we we just we just need to be bold. We need to we need to we need to be bold about it. We don't need to shy away from these topics. We the Bible is very clear, and there's a generation that's very confused about what the Bible has to say about their sexuality, about what the Bible has to say about their gender, what the Bible has to say about life. And I just think we need to be very direct, very clear, and consistent in that message uh, as pastors in this hour. Um, we can't shy away from it now inevitably someone that's a little bit older who's not who doesn't have their hands in in the mix who they're not dealing on a day-to-day -day basis pastoring and shepherding those that are struggling and wrestling through uh these things it's easy for us just to go ah and just sort of disregard gen z entirely like people who just watch the news like you said twitter or watch the evening news and they see you know drag queen uh story hour and like they see all of the yeah. extreme stories that i mean they're all very real but they just they go i don't even i don't even understand the world that i'm in anymore like can't even relate to it the idea of even transgenderism i mean really you know i know i'm dating myself but it's it's hard for someone my age to even really wrap my head around how it's so common in this sort of thing so that said as always, there's always judgment of one generation judging yeah. and looking down on another. But talk about some of the positive. Talk about not just, you know, th these are some of the clear differences. And, and the reason, obviously, that they're different is because they grew up in a different era. You know, um, you know, I grew up in an era where certainly I was exposed to pornography as a kid, but I didn't grow up in the generation where these kids were discipled you know, they grew up addicted to pornography from like an incredibly young age and just the things that that and then the messaging of the world has done to their mind, you know, so it's not like they're any different. They're people just like us, but they're part of a different generation. But talk, talk or speak to the issues where you find that they are the same, that that Gen Z is just like Gen X or baby boomers or this the type of discussions 
um, that are not often had. You know, we're always talking about how crazy they are or whatever. Right. But what are you seeing where they're I, basically no different? I mean, I the primary thing is I think they're very formidable. I think they're 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 uh, there's a a real purity in their pursuit for something greater than themselves. I see a real openness to the gospel when it's clear and it's costly that, that, that we're, we're not, I, I feel like God's dealing with cultural Christianity in America. Mm-hmm. And I think this generation is done with cultural Christianity. I, I don't think it's it, it to pray a prayer and to come to church once a week it's not cutting it for them. And so they're leaving the church in droves. Uh, and, and I think, I think, I think every generation in their teenage years is formidable. Most, most, I think statistics show most believers start to form and shape their, their view worldview, and then also view of the Lord and their, their, their teenage early twenties. And I, I think that's, that's happening right now. And I think it's an opportunity for us as, as pastors and leaders to really captivate this generation with the message of the gospel. And, and one of the, I mean, one of the mantras we have around here that we use is, is we're teaching a generation to die. We're teaching them to lay their lives down. And I actually think this generation could be one that, that that's marked by martyrdom. I think where this is going and the persecution and reading Matthew 24 and, and that, the the great day that's ahead of us i think that that they need to be equipped to do that and um i love dalton's book i just someone gave it to me recently um on to death death. yes it it, i mean that to me is what this generation's looking for they're looking for a cause that 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 is onto something greater than themselves and so my my favorite testimony in in um in the upper room is when parents show up at the upper room and it's a little, I mean, the environment's a little unique. It's, it's not the environment most of these kids grew up in. So their, their parents come in, they're a little uncomfortable, but with tears running down their face, they say, thank you for uh, reintroducing my son or daughter to a Jesus they attempted to leave. Mm. And, and I, I, I think that, that again, this generation is, is, is formidable as all are in their twenties. It's just, they're looking for more, and I think we owe it to them to give it the, the the full message of the gospel. That's beautiful, bro. That's a beautiful uh, story to, I think, wrap this up. That's there's there's a there's an awful lot of negative, depressing, deflating news out there, um, and that's the nature of news. Obviously, if it bleeds, it leads. They always put the negative stuff out there. There's a lot of amazing things. This is what I love. One of the reasons I love being part of the underground church, um, but um, for anyone who is getting their hands dirty, who is involved in doing the work of Jesus, there's a lot of beautiful stuff happening. There's a lot of good stories, and um, nothing makes me happier than hear that. You know, even as a dad with five kids that are 25 down to 10, you know, kind of all right in that window, just... Um, to light a kid on fire at that in that window of late teens, early twenties, that is, um, it's it's priceless. So mm-hmm. thank you so much for all all that you're doing. Thank you for your books, man. Thank you for uh, for your ministry and what it it is it is pioneering so much for guys like me that are uh, oftentimes don't have time to do the in depth study and. Uh, your writing it has just been so impactful. So thank you. And I'm excited. You guys are coming to Dallas. I hear in July FAI is to do a, a conference for a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. July 13th, 14th and 15th. Um, if you uh, just send me a text, I'll sneak you in the back door. Yeah. Well, Lee's going to be there, isn't he? My buddy Lee coming. Yeah. So Lee, Lee and I are, are good friends and uh, I'm excited he'll be here. So I hope to, if I'm in town, I'll be there on the front row. Yeah, in fact, I mean, you know, obviously that's, I'm not just trying to advertise that, but if you are there, um, like I, I'm serious, just text me and okay. because what we're going to do is we're going to have Lee uh, preach. Um, I interviewed Lee similar to this last week. And then I think what we'll do, I mean, everything's still in the planning stages, but I think what we'll actually do 
is in the context of when Lee shares, I think we're going to bring up any pastors in the room and just lay hands and just bless those that are at the front lines doing the stuff. So if you're able to make it awesome, um, it, lo awesome. we'd love to see it for sure. So, well, good, good chat, man. Just, you know, to me, conversations like this are important. And um, as I said, when I look out, I look at just vessels that the Lord is using who are making a big impact where it counts um, mm -hmm. where it really matters. You're, you're really, the Lord's using you in a, in a powerful way. And that's, um, it's yeah. Honor to be able to chat with you. So, yeah. so thanks so yeah. much for the conversation. Love shameless, you, uh, shameless plug real quick. We're doing a Gen Z for Jesus event, uh, September in Southern California. We did one last year here in Dallas. There were about 8,000 Gen Zers that showed up for 12 hours of worship. Okay. And the gospel was proclaimed. We didn't announce a band, didn't announce a speaker. We just got our TikTok influencers to invite Gen Z to an arena. And so such a success. We're going to hit Southern California into September. They can follow Gen Z for Jesus. Any Gen Zers watching or parents of Gen Z, Gen Z for Jesus is the ministry. And uh, we're stoked about Southern California. So it's really cool what God, again, is doing with Gen Z. Awesome. Awesome. Where, when you say Southern California, where at? Uh, we're thinking uh, Anaheim. We're we're still locking down a venue. That's why I don't have a date yet. But uh, it looks like it it looks like Anaheim or uh, uh, oh, what is the what is the temple there that Amy Simple McPherson used to preach in? Angelus Temple is that the name of it? Um, it's where Matthew Barnett is in the Dream Center. So that 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 could be a place as well. But we'll we'll put it online soon. Awesome. Awesome. Super cool. Yeah. Gen Z for Jesus. That's way better than Gen X for Jesus. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't know who's for Jesus anymore. So awesome, man. Good chatting with you, Michael. Um, hopefully we'll get a chance to see you, but if not, I'm sure we'll bump into you somewhere. Yeah. Thank you, man, for having me. What an honor. Absolutely. Keep up the good work. God bless. All right. God bless.